three little preschool boys were sitting in the Sunday school class as the teacher talked about the various celebrations that the church observed throughout the year. She wondered at their young age what all they had learned. And so she asked, can any of you tell me what Christmas is? And one little boy said, well, that's the day once a year that we get dressed up and go door to door throughout the neighborhood getting candy on the doorstep. She said, well, that's not exactly right, but who can tell me what the Lord's Supper is? And one little boy raised his hand and he said, that's when we eat turkey and dressing and cranberry sauce and celebrate the fact that the pilgrims had supper together with the Indians. And she said, well, that's not quite right, but who can tell me what Easter is? And one little boy, no doubt he was a deacon's kid. He raised his hand and said, that's the day we celebrate the fact that Jesus came to earth, died on the cross, was buried in a borrowed grave, rose from the dead on the third day, and if he sees a shadow when he comes out, we have six more weeks of winter. <laughs> well, all jokes aside, I fear there are a lot of professing Christians that have little more understanding of what Resurrection Sunday means than that. I, I mean, we've been to church, we've been in Sunday school, even those who come not as frequently as they ought. We, we have heard before that Christ died, Christ was buried, Christ was resurrected, but I fear we do not fully and completely understand all of the doctrinal and practical implications of that great glorious truth. And so I wish to teach you a simple truth this morning, a statement you'll note on the screen. The resurrection is the Father's public announcement that Jesus' payment for our sin has been accepted. You see, the empty tomb of Jesus means, among other things, That God's wrath has been abated. That his law has been satisfied. His demands have been met. For you see, in the death of Jesus, he paid for our sin. But in his resurrection, the Father publicly proclaims he has accepted that payment. We see that wonderful truth of grace on display in Hebrews 10 verses 1 through 18. And we see it in three simple ways. Notice with me in verses 1 through 4 what I've labeled the shadows before the cross. The shadows before the cross. If you've been with us in our Sunday morning study of Hebrews, you know that the truth we read in verses 1 through 4 is a major theme of the writer of Hebrews. In fact, he has spent the last few chapters telling us that the Old Testament system, that is the tabernacle, the temple, the Old Testament priests, and the sacrifices the people would bring, the sacrifices the priests would offer, The blood that would flow, the sacrifices made, all of that system was a sign, a symbol, and now a shadow. A sign points us to something. A symbol pictures something, but a shadow prophesies something. Even in the physical realm, whenever you see a shadow, depending on the angle of the sun, that shadow lets you know that something, indeed someone, is coming. And that's exactly what the writer of Hebrews teaches in verses 1 through 4. In fact, in verse 1, he calls the Old Testament system a shadow of the things to come and not the substance, the essence, the form of that actual thing. How do the Old Testament sacrifices picture, prophesy, and serve as a shadow of the cross of Jesus Christ? I think there are two ways that we notice in these first four verses. First, there's mention here of the repetition of sacrifices. Once again in verse 1, look at it in your own Bible. The scripture says these sacrifices they offer continually year by year cannot make perfect those who draw near. Verse 2, otherwise would they not have ceased to be offered Because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have consciousness of sin. He's simply saying, if any of those sacrifices had actually worked to wash away or remove sin, they would not have been continually offered. In the previous chapters, the Bible writer tells us that these sacrifices were offered year after year after year. But I believe the focus here is not so much on their number, but on their nature. Because their large number represent and picture for us their insufficient nature. Bottom line is they were offered again and again and again and again because they did not work. They could not wash away sin. 
Let me give you a simple example. If you've ever had any work done at your house, maybe, maybe a roof that needed to be repaired, a, a, a toilet that needed to be replaced, or, or maybe some work needed to be done on the carpet or the flooring in your house, and somebody else says, hey, didn't you have that company do some work for you? Would you recommend them to come do that work at my house? And suppose your answer was, well, I'll just say I had to call them back five different times. The implication is that's not a good recommendation. They didn't get it done right the first time. You had to call them back again and again and again as, as, as a symbol of the fact they didn't know what they were doing. The number of trips they had to make is an indication of the nature or the quality of their work. And the writer has that idea in mind when he says these Old Testament sacrifices were offered hundreds of thousands, indeed through the centuries, millions of different times, and they had to be offered again and again and again because human effort can never take away sin. Now, I don't believe there's anybody in this room today that has ever worshipped under a religious system where you brought a blood sacrifice. Unless you come here from another country, you've probably never approached the one you believe to be God with the blood of a sacrificed animal. Although many of us know what it's like to want to offer a teenager every once in a while. But you probably never have worshipped under a system like that. But I find there are Baptists every single day who try to bring their own human effort to appease God. So as grateful as I am that you're all here today, can I just be blunt with you? Church attendance will never wash away sin. You can come every time the doors are open, die lost, and bust hell wide open. You say, well, I'm here every time we have church. So is that piano, but it ain't going to heaven. Sunday school attendance can never wash away sin. Today is day one of a back to Sunday school campaign. I hope if you call Emmanuel your church home that you are in small group Bible study. But you can have a, 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 a series of perfect attendance Sunday school pens that, that will drag the ground and still die lost in your sin. Water baptism will not wash away sin. Now the Bible commands Jesus followers to be baptized and if you're a Christian and you've never been immersed in water to picture the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you ought to be the first one to come forward at the invitation and say, I'm a Christian, but I need to be baptized. When can I be baptized? But you can be immersed in every creek, river, puddle, pond, lake, stream, ocean. You can know the tadpoles by their first name, have dishpan hands and duck web feet and still bust hell wide open as a wet sinner dripping from head to toe with the insufficient waters of baptism. Human effort can never wash away sin. That's why if you're trying to do better and, and try harder and stop this and start that in your own human effort, that's why you live a frustrated life. You have to keep doing it over and over and over again. You know the reason why? Because it doesn't work. The repetition of these sacrifices are a reminder. We need something better. Indeed, we need someone better. And these sacrifices served as a shadow coming before the cross. We see that in the repetition of sacrifices. We see it also in the reminder of sinfulness. Verse 3, but in those sacrifices, are you looking at verse 3? In those sacrifices, there is a reminder year by year. You say, what is that reminder? That the blood of Bulls and goats cannot take away sin. You say, Brother Mike, why did God institute and command those sacrifices to be made if they could never wash away sin? To serve as a reminder. To serve as a picture of the fact that you are a sinner. That sacrifice is inadequate. You need something, someone better, greater, and higher. For example, imagine that as you came into church today, suppose that I asked you to bow your head and close your eyes. Now, I'm not at this moment, but suppose that I did. 
And suppose that I said, we're just going to have a little personal spiritual examination. And I ask you to think about any sins you've committed this past week. That's a good practice to do from time to time, by the way. But imagine that I said with heads bowed and eyes closed, have you said anything this week you shouldn't have said? Have you thought anything you shouldn't have thought? Have you done anything you should not have done? Then imagine that I said, were there some things you should have said that you did not? Some things you should have done, but did not. I wouldn't have to get too many questions before we would, if we're being honest, we'd be reminded of some sins. But that little exercise, if we took it by itself, does not wash away the sin. It just reminds you that you need those sins removed. In the very same way, the Old Testament sacrifices were brought as a reminder that we are sinners. And by the way, if you admit that you are a sinner, you're just agreeing with God and you're acknowledging what you and God already know about yourself. That there is none good, there's none that seeketh after God, there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3, 10 and 11. Romans 3, 10, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If you don't believe you're a sinner, ask your spouse. If you don't believe you're a sinner, ask your kids. And they will affirm what Isaiah 53 declared, that all we like sheep have gone astray. And each and every one of us has turned to his own wicked way. It was a second grade Sunday school class where the teacher was hammering down this truth that when we sin, we have to repent in order to have forgiveness. When we sin, we must repent before we can have forgiveness. And she beat that statement like a rented mule. When we sin, we have to repent before we can be forgiven. And then she said, who can tell me? What you have to do before you can be forgiven. And one little boy raised his hand and said, sin. Well, the truth is, sin precedes forgiveness. And because we have all sinned, these Old Testament system sacrifices reminded us that we're sinners. And by the way, the Holy Spirit still does that today through the proclamation of the Word of God. It is one function of the Holy Spirit, according to Jesus, to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. By footnote, that means if you enjoy every sermon I ever preach, either I'm not preaching much or you're not listening to much. Because when you get up under the proclamation of the Word of God, And the Spirit of God takes the Word of God and brings about the conviction of soul. It is a reminder that we have sinned before God and we must have the forgiveness of that sin. But our own human effort and religious practice will not wash away sin. We need that which the shadow prophesied. The shadows before the cross. Note with me secondly in verses 5 through 14, the sovereignty behind the cross. Now the word sovereignty simply is a reference to God being in absolute total control. You may say the providence behind the cross. The work of God behind the cross. I need you to understand today that the cross was God's idea. The cross was God's plan. Never get the idea that the cross was Satan's plan to try to thwart the work of God. The cross was God's plan. And it wasn't plan B or plan C. It was plan A from before the foundation of the world. So much so that at the great Pentecost sermon, Simon Peter said that all these things happened according to the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. In the Old Testament, Many of the prophets, indeed the psalmists acting as prophets, predicted some of the things that would happen around the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And here in verses 5 through 14, the writer of Hebrews quotes from Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8. It was a psalm of David. 
written a millennia before Jesus Christ came into this world. And I want you to watch this. Pay very close attention to this truth. A thousand years before Jesus came into the world, lived and died and rose again, the Spirit of God moved on the heart of King David to write and to predict it. But God did not merely know what was going to happen a thousand years in advance because he looked down through time and saw it. Now, he did look down through time and see it. But God did not know that it was going to happen merely because he could look ahead in time. He knew that it was going to happen because he's the one that planned it and caused it to happen. Never get the idea that when Adam and Eve fell into sin that God was in heaven wringing his hands with a furrowed brow, wondering, what will I do now? No. Jesus Christ is described as the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. You see, God did not come up with the idea of the cross after sin entered the world in Genesis 3. God had a plan for the cross before Genesis 1.1. I want you to see in this text the sovereignty behind the cross. Because God is the one who planned it. And here's why. It's his love that desired it, and his holiness demanded it. God came up with a plan for the cross because his love desired it. In this, the love of God has been manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him, 1 John 4, 9. And God is the one who planned and prepared and provided the cross because his justice demanded it. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I want you to notice with me the sovereign working of God moving toward and providing the death of Jesus on the cross. In verses 5 through 9 it involves first of all the preparation of Jesus' body. After telling us that The blood of bulls and goats could never wash away sin. Verse 5 continues. Look at verse 5. Therefore, when he, Jesus, comes into the world, Jesus says, Sacrifice is an offering you've not desired. That is, they, they never satisfied your righteous demands. But a body you have prepared for me. He repeats this idea in verse 6. And then in verse 7, Behold, I have come in the scroll of the book, It is written of me to do your will, O God. Jesus is simply quoting from Psalm 40 and says, Because those old sacrifices never abated your wrath or satisfied your holy justice, you have prepared a body for me. And I will now enter into that body and go to the earth to do your will. Now, as a footnote, I want you to notice something that is, to me is very powerful. This plan of redemption was devised in the eternal counsel of God before the world began. But that is not when Jesus is reading Psalm 40 to the Father. This text says that Jesus quoted from Psalm 40 just before he entered into the world. Now, Psalm 40, written a millennia, a thousand years or so before the first advent of Christ. But just before he came into the world, this passage teaches us that Jesus quotes from the Psalm of David. Now, most scholars believe that Jesus was born probably around 4 B.C. Because when we first tried to tie our calendars to the, de- to the birth of Jesus, we, the, the, the ancients missed a few years. So Jesus was most likely born around 4 B.C. Imagine in the year 4 B.C., Jesus Christ turns to the Father and quotes the Psalm of David. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in the heavens. And Jesus says, Father, it's like we had King David right. You've never been sacri- satisfied with all those sacrifices. You've prepared a body for me. And I'm about to turn the stars into a staircase and descend, condescend in fact, into a sin-cursed world and I will take on that flesh. I will take on a body of flesh and blood and I will go into the world to do your 
will. In a day where many preachers are telling us that we need to unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament, Jesus Christ is literally reading from it before he steps into this world through the womb of a virgin. Presbyterian preacher R. Kent Hughes comments here, What a high place this gives Scripture. Our pre-incarnate Savior quoted Psalm 40 as being prophetic of his thoughts at his human birth. Christ knew the Old Testament sacrifices would never satisfy the demands of holy justice. It would take a perfect sacrifice to atone for the sins of mankind. Indeed, it would take the sacrifice of an earthly, physical man. Bible students are well aware that from the earliest mention of salvation, he is described as the seed of a woman. Now, in this polite company, I don't have to be any more graphic than this. In reproduction, the seed is not in the woman. The seed is in the man. So in Genesis 3, when God prophesied that the seed of the woman would be bruised on his heel, but in the process, the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. That is a play on words that tells us that seed of the woman is coming into the world in a very unusual, miraculous way. It is an old picture of the virgin birth and the fact that God indeed would prepare a body for the Lord Jesus Christ. Or as Paul put it, that even though he existed in the form of God, Jesus did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. You see, it would take a man to be the seed of a woman and crush the serpent's head. So Christ took on flesh It would take a man to sit by the seaside and teach in parables as the ancients prophesied that he would. So our master took on flesh. It would take a physical man to touch the leper, to cleanse those that were sick, to speak healing to those that were lame. So the master took on flesh. It would take a man in a physical body to walk on water, to heal those that needed healing. It would take a man in flesh to live a perfect life. It would take a man in a body of flesh to die a sacrificial death. It would take a man in a body of flesh to rise up victoriously and triumphantly from the dead. So Jesus took on flesh. Listen, church, the blood of a bull couldn't do that. A goat couldn't do that for you. A turtle dove couldn't do that for you. The blood of a Passover lamb could not do that for you. So we say, come behold the wondrous mystery. In the dawning of the king, he, the theme of heaven's praise, is robed in frail humanity. In our darkness, in our longing, now the light of life has come. Look to Christ who condescended and took on flesh to ransom us. And all of it was part of God's plan to save you. The preparation of Jesus' body. But the sovereignty behind the cross also involves the payment of Jesus' blood. Look in verse 10, by this will, that is Jesus came in a body of flesh to do the will of God the Father. Verse 10 says, by this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That is, it was the sovereign will and plan of God that Jesus lay down his life and offer it as a sacrifice for the redemption of his people. That is, the will of God the Father brought Jesus down from glory where he would be despised and rejected. It took him into Gethsemane where he would be arrested. It led him on to Gabbatha where he would be flogged and beaten beyond measure. It led him up to Golgotha where he would be pierced through his hands and his feet where the sins of the world would be placed upon him. He would breathe his last, give up his spirit and die. It was the will of the Father that he be placed into a grave where he would be buried because Jesus' blood would be necessarily offered to atone for the sins of his people. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. In Acts 20, Paul said that Jesus Christ purchased the church for God with his own blood. The eternal song of Revelation 5 says that Jesus is worthy to take the scroll and break its seals for one reason. You were slain and with your blood 
You have purchased men for God from every tribe, nation, language, and people. Simon Peter described it like this in 1 Peter chapter 1. He said, For you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life, inherited from your forefathers, but here's how you were redeemed, with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. When I was in high school, even in middle school, there was a major epidemic that was sweeping across the world. It wasn't the Delta variant. It wasn't COVID-19. It was AIDS. AIDS really burst onto the scene because of, of Rock Hudson, Magic Johnson, Arthur Ashe, famous actors and athletes who came down with this terrible, terrible disease. I I grew up in those middle school and high school days where people didn't know much about it. Thought that it could be communicated by by airborne, by by droplets of, of, of spittle in the air. Perhaps it could be communicated by just a casual touch. And the world was in fear. And that's when we heard about a name, Ryan White. Ryan was a middle school student himself in Indiana. He was a year younger than me. Ryan White was a hemophiliac. He was a free bleeder. His blood wouldn't clot. And so the slightest little injury, he needed a blood transfusion. And in that day before we knew everything we now know about the AIDS virus, Ryan White contracted AIDS through a blood transfusion, tainted Blood. In a similar way, you and I have a problem. We've all got tainted blood. It's not necessarily tainted with COVID-19 or with the AIDS virus. But all of our blood has been tainted with the virus of Adam's sin. Sin entered the world through a man and death came by way of sin. And the Bible says now death Death has passed or spread. Death has now been communicated to all men. For all have sinned. That's why I cannot atone for my own sin. My blood is tainted in the sight of God. We would need a sacrifice who would have perfect blood. Precious blood. Sinless blood. Spotless blood to take away our sin. That's why we say what can wash away my sin? Absolutely nothing but the blood of Jesus. I'm talking about God's plan to redeem his people involved the preparation of Jesus' body and the payment of Jesus' blood. How satisfactory was that payment? Well, look now in verse 11. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sin, but he, having offered one sacrifice for sin for all time, sat down at the right hand of God waiting From that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool. For by one offering he has perfected, that is he has cleansed, he has sanctified and redeemed for all time those who are sanctified. Now the picture here is very simple. In the Old Testament system the priests would be on duty and they would offer blood sacrifices day after day after day after day all day long year round. In the part of the temple where the priests did their work, there were no seats. There was no stool, there wasn't a couch, there wasn't a love seat, no place for them to sit down because there was no need for them to sit down. While they were on duty, they were constantly offering sacrifices because those sacrifices never washed away sin. But in glorious, gracious contrast, the Bible writer here says that when Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice for our sin, listen church, He did something that other priests never did. He went and sat down. He sat down at the right hand of God. This is the glory of the resurrection because after offering himself, he rose from the dead, ascended back to the right hand of God, and the Father, according to Psalm 110, looked 
at the finished work of Jesus on the cross and said, Son, I'm so well pleased. My holy demands have been so met. My righteous justice so satisfied. Son, there's no more work for you to do. Pull up a chair and have yourself a seat. The work of redemption has been done. Jesus said, it is finished. Not I am finished, but it is finished. And he sat down, not because he was frustrated, flustered, or fatigued. He sat down because he was finished. He sat down at the right hand of God, not because he was distressed or disgusted or defeated. He sat down. Bless his name, he sat down because he was done. God said, everything done for the salvation of my people has been accomplished. It's saved. It's paid. It's done. God's sovereignty has been fulfilled through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Settled. Finished. And done. Watch him kneel in the garden of Gethsemane. Follow him to the flogging post. Trail him through a blood-stained pathway up to Calvary. Watch him die as a substitute be placed in a borrowed grave. Rise from the dead. Ascend to the Father and sit down at his right hand. And you will understand this. The resurrection is the Father's public announcement that Jesus' payment for our sin has been accepted. All this was the sovereign plan of God. Now one of the most common questions I get asked is, Pastor... Can you help me determine God's will for my life? Usually somebody that's at a fork in the road. They got a decision to make. And I can't always tell you God's will for your life. I mean, I don't know if God wants you to get married and if so, to whom. Students, I, I don't know for a fact God even wants you to go to college. And if he did, I don't know which school it is. I don't know if he wants you to go to a tech school or a trade school. And if so, I don't know what profession to pursue. I don't know what God wanted you to wear to church this morning. I just don't know. But I do know this. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 9, It is not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If you recognize today, maybe for the very first time, that you are a sinner and you need a Savior, let me tell you what the will of God is for you. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will be saved. And as Paul told the Philippian jailer, that that truth goes for you and everybody at your house. That truth goes for you and everybody on your pew. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. The shadows before the cross. The sovereignty behind the cross. Thirdly and finally, I want to say a few words about the salvation by the cross. For those who claim Christ as Savior, this is a very practical part of the message. For in the closing verses of this text, we find two things that happen when we come to Christ for salvation. So if these things have indeed happened to you, in you, and for you, you should say, as we sang earlier, glory to his name for the application of his blood. But if you profess Christ, listen very carefully. If you profess Christ and these two things have never happened to you, you've never been saved. You may have walked an aisle, filled out a card, whispered a prayer, raised a hand, gone through the baptistry. You may be teaching Sunday school or singing in the choir. But if the two things that I'm about to describe have not happened to you, you have never been saved. Transformation number one. When salvation comes by the cross, my soul has been regenerated. That is, there's been a transformation on the inside. Look in verse 15. We've already read about a dialogue that happened between God the Father and God the Son. And now God the Holy Spirit joins in, verse 15. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them, after those days says the Lord, look at this, I will put my laws upon their heart and on their mind, I will write them. Now this is the second time in the book that the writer of Hebrews has quoted this section from the book of Jeremiah. In which we are reminded that the first covenant, the laws of Moses, the Ten Commandments, 
were etched on tablets of stone. But in the new covenant, God does not write his law upon tablets of stone. He writes his law upon our hearts. Elbow your neighbor, make sure everybody's awake because this is important. If you've truly been saved, there is not a law outside of you pressing you in to get you to conform to it. There is now a law on the inside of you that is working its way out. Your heart has been changed. Your mind has been renewed. You don't think like you used to think. You don't believe like you used to believe. Your your appetites are different. Your attitude is different. Your, Your desires have been transformed by the power of God. That's why John would write in his first epistle that the commandments of God are not burdensome. Listen to me. The commandments of God are not burdensome to a child of God. A child of God doesn't get their lip out of joint and get bent out of shape that they've got to simply do what God has commanded them to do because it brings joy to the heart because the heart has been transformed. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a burden for a Christian to obey God. It's a burden for a Christian when we disobey God if you can sin and it doesn't burden down your soul you've never been born again in fact the writer of Hebrews will go on to say you're an illegitimate child if you can sin without conviction of soul people ask me pastor can I as a Christian sin all that I want to sin as a Christian you'll sin more than you want to sin because you don't want to sin anymore because your heart has been changed who you are has been transformed and you don't do what you used to do because you're not who you used to be are you listening to anything that I'm saying You don't like what you used to like because you're not who you used to be. You don't go where you used to go and say what you used to say because you're not that person anymore. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation and old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. As I said in the first service, this is why if you are lost... You don't mind, sir, cheating on your wife. You don't mind, ma'am, forsaking your husband. If you're lost, it brings you joy. But if you've been born again, when you fall into adultery, it grieves your heart and quickens your soul. And you say, oh, God in heaven, forgive me for my sin. If that's never happened to you, your soul has never been regenerated. I'll give you a simple example. Growing up, I used to eat a lot at Chinese restaurants. Now some of you are chuckling because it's pretty widely known in this church. I hate Chinese food. We used to eat it all the time. But along, right after Andrew and I got married, I went to a Chinese restaurant for lunch one day with some co-workers. And later that night, I got... Well, I know I'm among friends. Sick as a dog. I don't know that I got sick from the Chinese food, but I got sick with the Chinese food. I mean, long about midnight, it was Peking Palace all over again. You understand what I'm saying? And if you've ever had an experience like that, I'm talking about just with with a food. Scientists and biologists will tell you that physiologically it rewires the brain. I didn't even think anything about it till a week or so later. We went back to lunch at that same restaurant, walked in the door, and the smell of that food made me want to vomit. And I've never had a taste for it again. Look right here and listen to me. Something that I used to love, I don't love it anymore. Because my appetite has been changed. My mind has been rewired. I don't think like I used to think. Stuff I used to love, I don't love anymore. And stuff I used to not love, now I can't wait to do it. This is exactly why John said the commandments of God are not burdensome. It's because your mind, your heart, your soul has been regenerated. How did that happen? 
Well, last week we looked at 1 Peter 1, 3. I want you to see it again in this context. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be literally regenerated, begotten again, made anew. As Jesus said in John 3, you must be born again. Your first birth birthed you into the race of Adam, the race of sin and judgment. You've got to have a regenerating act of Almighty God to birth you again into the family of God. How did that happen? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead quickens the heart of a dead sinner and transfers them from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, from the kingdom of death unto the kingdom of life. And because you were dead but you are now alive, you've been transformed and you just don't enjoy what you used to enjoy. Anything like that ever happened to you? There's a church over in Waycross with one of those marquees where they change out the messages and change out the letters, you know, from time to time. I don't agree with all of their messages, but I like this one. It says, no change, K-N-O-W. No change, no Jesus, K-N-O-W, Jesus. If you want to know and realize change in your life, then you've got to come to know Jesus. Then it said, no change, N-O, no change, no Jesus. Because when salvation comes by the cross, your soul will be regenerated. There's a second thing that happens, and that is my sins have been removed. Now, y'all didn't shout me down too much in verses 15 and 16. Let's try it now in verse 17. And their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to point out again, he does not say, I will forget their sins. This is not a case of divine amnesia. He says, I will remember them no more. The word remember means to bring them up again to determine how I'm going to deal with you. That once your sins have been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, God makes this promise to you. I will never again bring up your sin for the purpose of determining how I'm going to deal with you. David understood this truth and in Psalm 103 verse 12 said, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our wrongdoings from us. And all of that happened through the once for all death of Jesus Christ on the cross. So when we come to verse 18, it's what John Phillips, the great commentator, called the punchline of the text. But he didn't mean it was a joke because it is no joke. Verse 18, now where there is forgiveness of these things. Hey church, are you grateful for the forgiveness of these things? The sins of the past. Where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. No more need for any more sin offerings because our sins have been gloriously removed. A little boy came to his preacher one day. Pastor. What do I have to do to be saved? And the preacher said, it's too late for you to do anything to be saved. And the little boy began to cry. You mean there's nothing I can do to be saved? The preacher said, nope, nothing you can do. But I've got good news. Jesus already did it. Now, we do understand that when the Philippian jailer said, what must I do to be saved? That the, the ultimate answer is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And believe that beyond that, there's nothing else that you can do. Because if you ever wonder if that one sacrifice for sin was sufficient to pay your sin debt, look to the empty tomb of Jesus and it will declare to you he only died and rose again one time. But once is enough.